Hello friends, good evening and welcome to today's session. I'm Dr. Radha Munje and uh, I have been entrusted with the task of being a moderator for today's two hour long workshop, Come a Master Class on Body Plethysmograph. And um, first of all, I would be thanking Dr. Talwar himself who would be running the show for almost two hours and then Indian Chess Society who is supporting this activity. So Dr. Rajesh and Dr. DJ Christopher, uh, a big thank you to you. And um, today we have um, with us uh, Dr. Talwar. Everybody knows him. And you don't need an introduction is the term which everybody uses. But uh, I'm sure if we would have held a poll before starting this presentation, and I would have asked everybody to poll. How many of you do not know Dr. Talwar? And uh, I think it would have been uh, a null set or uh, a void question. And again, if I would ask, have you never heard? Have you never heard him anywhere, either in the webinar or on in the conferences? Again, I think I would have. It would have been a worthless question. Uh, he is the most sought after faculty, and especially because uh, he is doing all that he is going to tell you or has been telling you. We have heard him talking about the phenom. We have talking uh, seen him talking about the impulse oscillometry, and now we come to an another block which would be probably removed away. That is about the body box. Uh, Dr. Talwar is a senior consultant and chairman of the Metro Center for Respiratory Diseases in Noida. He is the director and chair of the respiratory diseases there since last 22 years. Not only as a faculty, but he is most sought out a DNB guide and teacher. So probably it's the first choice when students decide to join the DNB courses and they want to run to Metro. Uh, he has had more than 50 students uh, enrolled with him, more than 18 national as well as international publications. He has worked as faculty in various capacities in the VPHS Institute, the RML Hospital, PJMR Chandigarh as well as uh, Lala Lajpatrai Hospital also. Uh, not only here but everywhere is the most sort of the faculty. And uh, now uh, before I hand over uh, the presentation for uh, Dr. Talwar to take over ahead, uh, I would request all the audience who has joined, please whenever you, when you are listening to this presentation, be attentive because there are going to be questions which you have to answer. And the, at these questions, we look at as if these are polls and we would know, Dr. Talwar would know where is the obstacle, which are the points which need to be explained to the audience. And uh, that is how we are going to carry forward uh, today's uh, whole workshop. So please be attentive and uh, be interactive, keep on polling, and whatever in spite of that you feel or you have questions, please continue posting your questions so that we can take them up either at appropriate time or when uh, he has already finished his presentation. Uh, so Dr. Talwar, I have almost taken more than five minutes. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Professor Radha, uh, for the wonderful words you have said about me. Actually, too wonderful. They were too wonderful. So thank you very much. I am I'm delighted to begin the day with such a such a you know happy note at a, such a happy note that uh, whatever you have said about me actually i don't deserve that much but definitely uh, i'm very happy that uh, you have introduced me in such a wonderful way uh, i know uh, professor radha for a very long time she's an avid teacher so when i approached her for this i think uh, it it was a delight to see that uh, she immediately agreed that okay this uh, this is a tough topic but i will be too happy to be a part of this uh, uh, and moderate this because uh, obviously it's a, it's a difficult topic we all understand and all of you who have joined this uh, webinar today uh, my job is make it basically to make you understand this and uh, make it easy so that if tomorrow you will be talking about uh, uh, getting uh, you know experience of body box you will perhaps not run away and that was my first experience in my life you know it was way back in 1991 that was the time when I had joined uh, Mulana Zad Medical College and they had just bought a body box at that point of time. And nobody exactly knew what to do with that box. So it was just lying there for a couple of months and everybody was trying to see how to make it work and things like that. 
so i was introduced to body box almost about more than 30 years ago more than 30 years ago but i do know that uh, it has i never thought at that point of time that it will be a into clinical practice i thought it is primarily for research purposes and we will be used utilizing it for post graduate thesis work and perhaps publishing some papers but from then onwards and uh, now we have a body box since 2015 in our institute so for last 5 years we have been using it i i am i'm so happy that this thing has finally entered into clinical practice where it has made the thing so easy for us that really we have now uh, far away from those uh, diffusion uh, nitrogen multiple breath breath and helium dilution methods which we used to do and which were very difficult uh, and time consuming and of course uh, there were many other issues which i'm going to discuss a uh, 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 little bit today itself so uh, thank you everyone and uh, this is the first one body box as she has said ics and uh, pax india has combined together and uh, the idea is that at the end of the seminar you would be able to be very comfortable with the topic of body box plethysmography so to begin with i think as uh, dr radha has very rightly said you know there are lots of questions here and the idea of these questions is you know i will understand which point needs to be highlighted more one what she has already said and second it is for you also to learn actually you know that perhaps this is also a right answer but maybe an, in an individual situation the approach will change altogether so where you need to modulate your approach is also something which you need to learn from today's seminar and we come to the first poll question dr radha can you take this question please for the audience uh, so audience uh, we bring you back on the road and make you attentive with the first question the first question is body box plethysmograph can de determine all of the following except so there is one thing which is not true and you have to tick that so uh, the first choice is lung volume second is airway resistance third is airway conductance and fourth is diffusion study uh, you can start polling now we'll give you 10 to 15 seconds to do your polling and uh, as you know, know uh, all of you have been uh, doing various lung function tests depending upon the machines that you have and access to the clinic if you do not have your own so there are various lung volume about which uh, you all know and the commonest are when you talk about ventilators you talk about the tidal volume and its setting then you have uh, other volume uh, when you talk about the various diseases and especially when you look at them and when we are talking in context of body plethysmograph there would be function uh, there would be residual volume then there would be total lung volume when you go on to the airway resistance then you have the various uh, nomenclatures which come to you in the form of s ro g ro am i correct dr talwar yes because these have been the nominations which uh, we just look at but uh, hardly refer to them so this is the resistance which you see then uh, there is airway conductance that is the actual air flow which is uh, flowing through the airways and the diffusion studies and all of you know about the diffusion studies where you look at the diffusion capacity of the lungs and it is uh, decreased in various diseases but at the topmost and of most interest to all pulmonologists today stand the interstitial lung diseases for which it is being commonly used though it has a lot of applications in pulmonology Uh, so have we finished the polling and uh, let us see what are the answers that we get and when i look at my screen and look at the answers just a moment and i'll add to that and uh, the maximum people that is 54.7% that almost 60% are saying that diffusion studies are something which cannot not body box cannot determine diffusion study however however almost 10 15 to 20% of the people feel that it cannot even determine airway resistance and conductance so over to dr talwar go ahead 
Thank you, Radha. I think it is wonderful response that at least 50% do know that diffusion is not a part of body box, but primarily we have been actually thinking about body box long ago for the compliance studies because lung volumes were primarily being done at that point of time by helium dilution method or by nitrogen washout methods. So at that point of time, when the body box came, we started thinking about the lung compliance and airway resistance. So airway resistance, which is called raw, and airway conductance, which is called gauze. So these are the new terminologies, which are a little difficult. And since we don't use much in clinical practice, we always think about that the body box at the moment for clinical practices for lung volumes, but it can determine. And in fact, in the same breath, when you are doing the lung volume, you will also get airway resistance and you will also get airway conductance. So, so raw and gaw is a part of the procedure which is done in a body box and it will come as a byproduct as a result for all cases you will perform the body box plethysmography. So this comes actually bundled with it. For a diffusion study, of course, you need a separate apparatus, you need a diffusion gas. You, it's a totally a different thing. You can attach it to it, but then it is not a part and parcel of a body box. The, the idea why we brought it, the entire thing to you is that if you look at the body box, you can see that there is a transducer and there is a shutter and you sit in a cabin which is pressurized and you know the volume and the pressure of it. And that volume and pressure of the box versus volume and pressure in your in, in your airways and in the lungs is something which is going to determine the lung volume. So that's that's what we are talking about. So it's basically we are looking at uh, lung volumes, but we will also see because we have a flow sensor, we have a trust, uh, we have a pneumotechograph which is looking at volume and flow and pressure. So it can also give us the values of what is the called we call it airway resistance and airway conductance. So that brings us to question number two, and I again go back to Dr. Radha. Uh, which of the second question is which of the following lung volume cannot be measured by spirometry? The first is inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, thoracic gas volume, tidal volume, and all of above. Uh, I need not elaborate on the various volumes. Uh, uh, the cho MCQs which have been given here, the choices. Uh, but why this question is kept here is because spirometry by far is the most favored and most sought after uh, investigation, uh, which is advised and everybody looks at the flow volume curve and the values that you go get on the spirometry. However, you should be aware that out of this, the tidal volume, which is the volume of air, at rest, which is inspired and expired, is the tidal volume. The inspiratory reserve volume, as you know, that the end of quiet inspiration, if you take a deep inspiration, that would be inspiratory reserve volume. Dr. Talwar, you can correct me whenever I go wrong because I should not be misguiding my audience, and uh, they should not, they should be following with uh, a good intent, you know. Yeah. So I so, think very right. I think we would have got the answers by now. Yes. Uh, I would look at the results now. And uh, the answer is expiratory reserve volume. Uh, <laughs> that is the answer given by uh, all uh, to the tune of 80%. And uh, very few have uh, said that it's inspiratory reserve volume and thoracic and uh, tidal volume also. So I was thinking this question, Dr. Radha will like to omit actually that it is not required. But I think it is very important for us to understand yes. that uh, basic spirometry rules we have to understand because that's what we are doing every day. So spirometry is a dynamic procedure. You know, you, you breathe out and then you breathe in it and then you breathe out as much as you can. So this is entirely a dynamic procedure. But there is something which cannot be measured by this dynamic procedure is the amount of air which is left in your lungs. That's called reserve volume, basically. So there was no choice here, reserve volume, because if we would have given you a reserve volume choice, you would have immediately picked it up. But what we have given you is a thoracic gas volume. So what thoracic gas volume also requires, it's basically an FRC. So what it requires is the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. And since the residual volume cannot be determined by spirometry, so anything which will require calculation of residual volume 
cannot be taken care of by spirometry and it will require the lung volume studies. So there will be various volumes and uh, 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 what we say about capacities. But uh, in this uh, slide, I'm trying you to focus on volumes. We know there are four volumes, inspiratory reserve volume, uh, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume. Now, if you see that, only residual volume is the static lung volume, and it cannot be determined by spirometry. And when we do this uh, thoracic gas volume, which is at the FRC level, when you are normal breathing, and at the end expiration, whatever is the gas which is normally left behind in the lungs is a thoracic gas volume. And to calculate that, you not only need expiratory reserve volume, but you also need a residual volume. Expiratory reserve volume you will be able to do by the spirometry itself. Because once you, with a normal tidal breathing, you try to breathe out everything which is still you can, that will be the expiratory reserve volume. So you can see that this is, you, you can actually start this procedure by going down up to this and taking it here. So that much is possible. But then below the expiratory volume is the residual volume that cannot be seen by the spirometry. So if you remember four volumes and four capacities. So first lesson in the four volumes is it is a residual volume and see if the residual volume is required for thoracic gas volume, which is primarily the measure which we are going to look for today is the one which cannot be determined by the spirometry. That brings us to question number three. And then Dr. Radha will take this question. The third question is, which of the following lung capacities can be measured by spirometry? The one is the inspiratory capacity. Second is functional residual capacity. Third is total lung capacity and none of the above. Uh, the audience to concentrate that we are yet talking about spirometry and not about the body box as of now. And Dr. Talwar? I think everybody has to learn this. The body box works with a spirometry. Actually, there cannot be a body box without a spirometry. Yes. You need the spirometric indices to calculate the lung volumes, which we are going to do it later on. So that's why I think it is so important that we are bringing these questions here. And uh, everybody has said, which of the following lung capacity can be measured? Can. And the choice to the tune of 80% is inspiratory capacity by the audience. So that means we are we are correct as far as capacities are concerned, but we were yes. wrong as far as the volumes were concerned. Uh, no, Dr. Yeah. Talwar, uh, the audience had polled well, but for first question, there was first objective, the MCQ of the, the choice. Uh, there wasn't almost any vote, so I interpreted it wrongly. It's my mistake. <laughs> and I really thought that how could it be? I went back and uh, I have absolutely no qualms about accepting it. Anyway, but we are, we have to explain it. Uh, there so are it these are sometimes a lot of confusion in, into this. And I think this is the basic picture of four law volumes and four capacities, which we have learned from our physiology, right? First year of our MBBS, that yes. there are four lung volumes and four lung capacities. And you can see that functional residual capacity, residual volume, total lung capacity are the three things. So one volume and two capacities, which are going below this dynamic function testing. So this upper box, if you can see, is the dynamic lung function testing, testing which can do everything which is possible with the spirometry. But those which are extending below this box, that is TLC, FRC, and residual volume cannot be measured by the spirometry because these will require the static static volume and that is the residual volume so most importantly uh, one volume and two capacities cannot be determined so that's why inspiratory capacity was absolutely correct that you can do it by spirometry and uh, from there we go on to the fourth question before we start today that uh, when do you need lung volumes in your practice so dr radha said that uh, you ask them uh, when do when do you require lung volumes from the postgraduate perspective but i would also say that uh, if you are answering it from your perspective, you are already a clinician, then when do you use it? So Dr. Radha, for you. So the fourth question is, before we go on with actual plethysmography, which is the time when you need to ask for a plethysmography or various lung volumes? Is it for obstructive lung disease, which is mainly uh, airway disease, restrictive lung disease, where the there is... Um, Restriction of lung function, 
whether you need it for diagnosis of various cystic lung disease and especially the bronchiectasis acid or do you need for all of these or you don't need for these and there are some other indications for lung volumes in practice because this is this is i think a very important question because you are the one who is going to request this particular investigation for your patient so you have to know which category of patients or which patients with a particular underlying disease should be requested for the various lung volume and the answer which we got was all of the above most of them uh, have said that for all of the above and few of them have opted for the first two that is obstructive and restrictive hopefully nobody said none of the above dr radha uh there was somebody one one i cannot be dishonest <laughs> Okay. so that was the precise reason you know because lots of us do not in, in fact ever ask for lung volumes because spirometry is more than sufficient for picking up the diagnosis which is most commonly obstructive airway disease but i think the lesson which we need to learn is no restrictive lung disease can be diagnosed without a total lung capacity which does require a residual volume estimation and which will require static lung volume determinations so the the like we do that obstruction is fev1 over fvc ratio the restriction is primarily by decrease in total lung capacity and total lung capacity requires lung volume so you can actually obstructive lung diseases manage easily by a spirometry you may require other studies for looking at various other aspects physiologically what is going on wrong and many things which we are going to discuss that's right but for restriction you cannot diagnose restriction you can get suspicion that it is there because fvc is reduced but fvc reduction does not mean that this has patient has a restrictive lung disease because restrictive lung disease is being diagnosed purely on the basis of restriction of total lung capacity which is the tlc and that cannot be measured by spirometry so we do it for confirming the restrictive disease that's the first and the foremost because you cannot diagnose a restrictive lung disease purely by the spirometry and you, you can have yes no doubt about it there they, you you look at the spirometry reports and you say yeah this is a restrictive disease but confirmation of restrictive disease requires reduction in tlc subtype restrictive lung diseases now what kind of a restriction it is there it is from chest wall is it from lungs it is for other factors so you need to distinguish between what is causing restriction in the restrictive lung volumes in this patient that again requires that similarly in obstruction fev1 over fvc ratio is reduced in asthma in copd in bronchitis in bronchiolitis in so many other airway diseases like dr radha said but which type of it and that again will require the determination of the lung volumes whether the lungs are big or lungs are normal so that will depend upon whether there is there is a, what kind of a airway obstruction there is and that requires air trapping versus hyperinflation to be identified which again will require the estimation of residual volume and total lung capacity and of course there are patients in whom you get combined obstruction as well as restriction and in those situations it is very difficult to interpret on the basis of spirometry alone so which is causing what is actually required again by looking at your uh, the lung volumes determination which again is like tlc and residual volume two are the most important things which need to be uh, uh, to be calculated in such kind of patients and many a times like you can have uh, obstruction and restriction mixed there may be more than one restriction a patient may have interstitial lung disease with the uh, uh, neuromuscular uh, weakness so there may be multiple causes of restriction possible in an individual patient there may be a patient with a obstructive airway disease with a diaphragmatic palsy so there are like complex situations which needs to be dealt with in respiratory medicine where the lung functions would be of tremendous help but primarily uh, we need to distinguish between obstructive and restrictive diseases and that brings us to now the question on uh, lung volumes because now we have come to the, uh, the the question that today's main aim is to look at the lung volumes so what are the methods to measure the lung volume dr radha i i feel this is a googly question which has come up which are the methods of measuring lung volume do you do it by body plethysmography nitrogen washout inner gag dilution technique the chest radiograph or ct thorax or all of the above so audience please start polling
so this depends i think the answer would depend upon you know from where we have uh, uh, you know uh, we have our our experience of seeing where the lung volumes are being determined in which particular manner and i'm pretty sure that a uh, lot of people wouldn't have got an access to a body box plethysmograph where they would have actually seen the lung volumes being determined by body box and might have used other methods so almost, that is all other methods are here almost 90% of the people, uh, our colleagues say that uh, it's all of the above however few of them feel that chest radiograph is uh, useful and ikka dukka hai jo believe in nitrogen washout and ct for it so that shows that you know how common the nitrogen washout methods and other methods have become for determination of lung volumes now because of the procedural comp procedural being complicated and of course uh, many other issues like acquiring these gases to perform the tests uh, so we have all of them you were correct there is body box plethysmography there is nitrogen washout method single breath nitrogen washout method in which you can also determine the closing volume and closing capacities you have inert gas dilution uh, techniques uh, uh, like uh, helium and uh, helium dilution method in which you can do it and of course radiographic methods chest x ray and ct both of them and uh, of course the chest x ray is a very uh, very uh, subjective method of looking at uh, the pa and the lateral films where you will be able to see that there is a lot of uh, lung volumes which are looking bigger in size which shows that the lung volume is high tlc is high because it is done at deep inspiration or maximum inspiration but they are more or less you know subjective ones ct thorax has come into a lot of uh, uh, you know interest at the moment because uh, we want to follow up these patients and uh, the, if the cts are being done so frequently and particularly in patients with interstitial lung diseases can we can or patients with the emphysema and copd so can the uh, the repeat ct scans be used as to see at uh, what is happening to their lung volumes are they becoming bigger or they becoming smaller depending upon obstructive or uh, restrictive lung disease and very important in restrictive lung disease so these are the studies which try to you know look at the lung volumetry which is by an automated method by already ct scans which has been done so you know in cts now there are a lot of computerized gimmicks which are done with it so you have a data which is so huge that you can do so much with it it depends upon the applications which are provided with the ct machines so you can do that you can reconstruct the lungs they look like that and you can even calculate the volumes in liters that the right lung is how many liters and the left lung is how many liters and the total lung capacity is how much and surprisingly it has been found to be very closely correlating with the lung volumes which are determined by other methods so that that means the ct is really pretty close to it but the important thing by this study which try to look into uh, is that uh, inter individual variation in the total lung capacity which is done by the oct scans is to the tune of about 16% which is quite a huge number if you are following up a patient of interstitial lung disease and at the end of one year you say that patient is like 60 15% uh, uh, fall in total lung capacity this could be an inter individual variation because the breath holding is the most important aspect of a ct scan on the basis of which automated lung volumetry is being done but yes it is coming pretty close and it might become even closer before the uh, for the various uh, automated machines of ct scan but by far we are going to talk about body box principle so you can stay, you can see that it is in fact more than two centuries ago when somebody had thought about it that you can really because the lungs are suspended in the chest so there is a principle which can be applied to look at it what is happening into the lung capacities and lung volumes and the one way of doing it is that you can see that uh, there is a barrel in which the gentleman is pushed right up to the neck and the moment he breathes in and breathes out the level of water goes up and down which tells you actually what is the lung capacity which is happening perhaps to the total lung capacity in such situations or the vital capacity can be measured and also initially these kind of boxes were made in which you can see the animals were put inside to look at the total amount of air in their lungs which can be seen as like a total lung capacity so it's been pretty old idea to work on a body box but it took almost 200 years for it to come to clinical practice that's that's what is very important 
and uh, this is the guy in 1956 he first invented this box you can see that these are almost like you know you put the patient inside in a refrigerator and then close it completely like a vault kind of a thing and you will feel so claustrophobic by sitting into this kind of a scenario and it took from 1956 i was not even born at that point of time but it has finally come into practice after so many years maybe 60 years so the the next question is that this is very important uh, from the perspective of understanding the body box so dr radha so the sixth question is body box plethysmography works on which law of physics is it, is it the poisson's law boyle's law henry's law dalton's law or fick's law uh, we have always seen people talking about the i einstein's e is equal to mc square and we rarely go beyond uh, those laws but uh, here dr uh, talwar wants us to visit all our basics and let us see which of uh, these laws so in fact uh, dr radha i had put up names of only all the laws which are be being used by medical physics basically we are yes. using so they are either in the airway circulation they are in yes. blood circulation they are diffusion of gases yes, they are yes. diffusion into the blood so all of them are actually being used in our medical science and they are and very relevant to us but only thing is we are asking about body box yes and uh, we also know about the hemoglobin oxy hemoglobin and hemoglobin dissociation so based on other laws and so on and the audience says that so everybody has agreed to boyle's law but to the tune of 4 to 5% also feel that it is poisson's law or the fick's law probably because this uh, has been referred to uh, heard, quite commonly heard about these laws basically yes yes so that was boyle's, yes very good we talk about in nebulization all the time these kind of laws yes the uh, boyle's law 90% and above people have said so that's correct so that's what we are looking at body box today that if you put a person inside then you know there is one thing which we talk about that the the p1 v1 is equal to p2 v2 so pressure and volume is constant and if you try to increase one the other one will decrease and that's why beautifully in this syringe where there is a balloon you can see that we have a pressure in the balloon and we have a volume of that balloon so in that entire syringe if you try to push it further you will be increasing the pressure and that pressure on that balloon will lead to decrease in size of the balloon so the volume will decrease so that the product of pressure and volume remains the same that's the principle p1 v1 is equal to p2 v2 so two situations in one situation resting you have a pressure volume relationship there is a some amount of volume and some amount of pressure which is like relevant now if you change that position then whatever the product will be there it will be proportionately changing so that the the p and v the, in the baseline is equal to p and v of the second thing what you have done like we are trying to show it here so even if you withdraw it you will be able to increase the volume and then the pressure will fall so something it is in the inverse relationship to maintain this volume as a constant but the important issue here is that the temperature should remain the same if the temperature changes then this law will not be valid and that's one of the laws which we were talking about that uh, in which the temperature is not constant that's i think henry's law basically so now these body box are primarily because of two variety in one you can see the volume changes and in the other one the volume is fixed now you can see this is the rigid box in which the person will sit here everything is inside and the volume of this box is fixed and you will be changing the pressure which will be by the transducer which will be provided here on the other hand you have another type of a box in which the volume will change so you are sitting outside and then doing this procedure and you are pushing the volume in and out so obviously the volume will change here so in this is the, the, there is either a fixed volume or a variable volume so you can see this typically the variable volume the person is sitting outside and uh, the patient breathes outside the box the volume changes from the body in the lungs is also being transmitted into the volume of this box so the changes in the volume are recorded on a pneumotac and in the mouth pressure from the mouth you have a direct pneumotac from where the you can take the mouth pressure 
which is considered as equivalent of alveolar pressure so you have a pressure in the lungs being measured you have a pressure outside in the box being measured and you have volumes so these two volumes and two pressures if you have you can calculate actually what is the volume in the lung so you need to know three things out of four to get to the volume in the lungs and at whatever level you will perform it that will give the volume if you are at normal end expiration you will get frc if you completely exhaled out you will get rv if you are doing it from the top of your lungs then obviously you will get the tlc so it will be able to do and since the pre the entire procedure is standardized at the frc level that is the normal end expiration what we will be determining will be frc since this frc is going to be determined by plethysmography it will be called frc pleth if you do it by dilution method you will call it uh, frc dilution method helium dilution or nitrogen washout you actually frc is to be given another uh, you know they they tag along with it that what was the method used to it and that i will tell you little later that what is the importance of it you can see the variable volume can also do compliance and gas compression studies also so these were the ones which were initial uh, body boxes which came came up with it and for the compliance purposes you need to pass in the esophageal catheter for esophageal balloon for uh, recording the esophageal pressure to calculate the compliance so these were really tidy uh, the little difficult ones but of course for the research purposes compliance studies used to be done with this now what we get easily is something like this constant vo volume body box you can have lung volumes you can have also dynamic lung volume so because it has got a spirometer in it and you can have airway resistance and conductance all can be calculated by this patient sits inside the box the box volume is about 700 liters and patient breathes inside the box only so there is a pneumotachograph which we are trying to show you here and this will record the flow and there is a shutter here so the shutter will record when the mouth is open and you are breathing and when the shutter closes then it is against the closed shutter the, the whatever are the changes inside the lungs are being recorded by the pressure transducer which is on the transducer there so changes which are happening in the body and which are being taken away by uh, taken care of by the pneumotach are also happening in the box because ultimately the box where volume and pressure has to remain the same so whatever is happening in the lungs has to be in the by product and uh, in equation with whatever is happening in the box so in the box you can have the measurement of pressure and you also know that if the volume increases how much of the pressure will change with that so that all calculations which are being done for uh, for the body box is basically the body box plethysmography now it is computerized so it is very easy to perform it if we have to do it manually it will become very tedious procedure to perform so this is how it looks like you can see that the person is sitting inside the box pneumotach is inside so the spirometry can be done from there and there is also a shutter mechanism which will close when the person is doing tidal breathing uh, tidal breathing and uh, <clears throat> the measurements are done during physiological conditions that is the quiet breathing and in the box you have the known volume and the transducer is also there in the box which uh, will take the pressures inside the box and we also have a calibration that how much change in pressure produces how much change in volume so all these things are already known so once the patient does this procedure which is simple normal tidal breathing during which once initially the shutter is open second when the shutter is closed so basically these two things needs to be done so that brings us to question number 7 that uh, body box is primarily used to get which of the following parameter so uh, madam will tell you that this is uh, the question was basically uh, only one parameter is calculated by the uh, body box rest all have to be derived so if they have to be derived you need to have your spirometric indices so that is why the body box plethysmograph is not alone enough to do the lung volumes and everything you need to have a spirometry along with it i have seen sometimes people say go and get the lung volumes you can't get lung volumes without getting a spirometry so spirometry is required for that so which is that volume which we see so over to you dr radha so you have the choice of is it the total lung capacity is it the functional residual capacity is it the reserve volume is it the erv or the it is a inspiratory reserve volume and you can start polling 
So I think we have already discussed ERV and IRV. So nobody will be choosing. So ultimately, uh, the will yes. be between one, two, three. I think uh, that would be one of the easiest question, and uh, we should go ahead with uh, looking at the poll results only. Yeah. Let us not spend much time on this. And now, see your question was uh, primarily for what? Okay. and the answers that we have are around 45 to 50% say that it is primarily for the functional residual capacity only 28% feel that it is for the total lung capacity another 25% feel that it is for the reserve volume and uh, very few feel that it is for erv and irv okay so i think uh, maybe uh, dr radha you are correct that the question was like primarily or perhaps if we would have asked it that what do you determine by body box one single volume maybe yes. that things might have been little dif different or uh, in a different way but i think most of them have picked up frc frc plet frc plet that's what we determine by the body box and rest are all calculated the residual volume you have subtract the erv you add uh, irv and uh, inspiratory inspiratory capacity to that and you get the total lung capacity so total lung capacity cannot be directly measured by body box residual volume if you do the procedure add the residual volume it can be still but as i told you the standardization is at normal quiet breathing so if you do a lot of these kind of procedure like forced procedures at that point of time the values may become fallacious so it is called thoracic gas volume so you can see in this picture that thoracic gas volume is basically a, a combination of residual volume and expiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume is a part of spirometry only and you can see that that is why after the procedure is done in fact a complete a spirogram or a spirometry procedure is done from normal tidal breathing patient exhales out completely till he reaches his residual volume takes a deep breath and then exhales out so we are getting inspiratory capacity and we are getting expiratory reserve volume these two measurements are required to get into tlc residual volume and frc we are determining by the body box so this is the since the end of normal tidal breathing the amount of gas which is inside the chest is called a thoracic gas volume and this is almost equal to frc but it will be a little higher then if we do it by other techniques and that's what we are going to say that total gas volume is not always equal to frc because there is some gas in the abdomen which will also be accounted by the the gas which is going to be, com be compressible when we do in the body box plethysmography it amounts to about 100 ml so there is going to be a change about 100 ml because of this abdominal gas volume effect and uh, it 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 will depend upon the patient to patient there may be people who might be having a lot of gas actually there in the abdomen which may actually uh, lead to fallaciously high thoracic gas volume and sometimes even the procedure how do you pant using your diaphragm which will try it with the with the abdominal muscle contracting which will try to push in uh, the, the the diaphragm down may also contribute to a little more uh, extra abdominal vol uh, gas volume effect being produced on the thoracic gas volume estimation so we need to remember that these are the, the these are the few things which we need to understand for uh, what we get from the thoracic gas volume as frc is actually frc plet and it may not be equal to frc by helium dilution or frc by the uh, nitrogen washout methods mm -hmm. so in certain situations also the thoracic wall uh, gas volume can be overestimate and then uh, obviously it, if that is more the total lung capacity will also become more and that is primarily because we do this entire procedure thinking that whatever we are measuring at the mouth is same as the alveolar when it is closed and when it is open so it is like reflecting the same thing so there must be some lag of the air flow during tidal breathing which can happen and this will be like of no importance when the person has normal airways or mild airway obstruction but those who have got severe air flow obstruction there may be delay in transmission of this gas from the alveoli to the mouth and hence there may be underestimation of the uh, air uh, airway pressure at mouth thinking that uh, this is reflecting the alveolar pressure but it may not be doing so so that's that's the important point to remember that when there is airway obstruction very severe 
then it may not be that accurate and there may be some plus minus 5% changes which might come into it. And this is this can also happen when the airways are very compliant or you do a very high panting frequency. So we will show you what the panting frequency is required to do the procedure of uh, body box plethysmography. But if you do pant very fast, then also that uh, airway pressure and alveolar pressures may not be equilibrating and hence the pneumotac may not be able to give us the, the accurate alveolar pressures in which situation again the thoracic gas volume will not be an accurate determinant of the FRC. So we need to pant at less than 10 hertz, which is like around 30 to 40 breaths per minute. So what you need is a normal breathing, which will be about 18 to 20 breaths and increase it for the panting procedure to somewhere around 30 to 40, which is required. But if you shoot it to beyond 60, then again, it is going to be a fallacious value coming up that where the thoracic gas value may not be accurate. So you need to keep this, uh, you know, the, the, the panting to a level which is acceptable around 30 to 40. So if that, that's the difference between the gas methods and the body box. So you can see that body box is fairly accurate. And in fact, it is the most accurate as far as uh, in between one test to the other the test is concerned, repeatable, reproducible. It is very fast. In fact, what it requires is less than 10 seconds to do a lung volumes. And you also get airway resistance and airway conductance with it. And it, but of course, the equipment is expensive. And the, the biggest drawback of the body box is that you need to sit inside the box and the box has to be closed. So those who get claustrophobic will not be able to get into the box at all because the moment you try to close the box, they will, they'll, they'll be frightened and they will try to come out of the box. Although it is not a common phenomena, but we do come across certain patients who will just refuse to get into the body box. Some of the people who are very severely obstructed, very severely breathless, they also feel claustrophobic and they will not like to get into the box. So that, that according to me and the cost are the only two factors which are uh, against the body box. But if you look at the washout and gas dilution techniques, they are very time consuming. And once you have done the test, the gases are already in the body. You can't repeat it. You have to wait for it. Let the gases wash out from there. And they are less accurate. And of course, we know that they will only be able to measure the, the gas which is in communication. So if you have a bulla, if you have a closed, uh, um, uh, if you have a air trapping, things like that, then the gas dilutions and the nitrogen washout methods will not be able to determine. So that can only be determined by the body box. So in very importantly, if there is a bulla patient who is undergoing for surgery, then the, the nitrogen washout will not be able to give it to us. The, the value of how much is the size of the bulla there. So such situations, obviously the body box is the answer in the, uh, going for that. So how much is the difference between the FRC which we determine by the dilution methods versus the body box methods? So this is what it is trying to show you here that about 300 to 400 ml is the difference. That is by considering all other uh, things which can contribute to the thoracic gas volume beyond the FRC. So uh, we, we, we do the uh, alveolar volume. So alveolar volume, we know that uh, we are going to determine and there is going to be 150 ml, which is going to be the dead space volume. So little more than that. So how do we do the alveolar volume? We do by diffusion studies. In the diffusion studies, basically it is the helium dilution method which is being used and helium dilution is going to give us VA. So VA is close to what are we looking at the total lung capacity. But there has to be additional things because it will be to the tune of almost about 85 to 90 percent in healthy people. But in unhealthy people, in unhealthy lungs, the, the equation would change. So that's why you need uh, an, uh, you, you just can't go by a by a VA estimation on a diffusion capacity thinking about what is the what is the, uh, the total lung capacity of this individual. It can give you some idea, but in disease conditions, it is not appropriate to assume. And if there is a difference of almost three liters between what you determine by VA and what you determine by TLC body box, that means there is a bulla in this patient. And that bulla needs to be taken care of and you can pick up by a CT scan also. So this is one study, you know, which tried to look across the patients who were normal, obstructed or restrictive lung diseases. And they tried to do by the multi-breath helium dilution method, body box plethysmography, and they also use the radiographic CT scan method, trying to find out which is the best one. And they found that CT scan was as good as body box. And they also found 
that helium dilution is the one which gives lower lung volumes volumes in particularly the patients who have got airflow obstruction so underestimation of lung volumes in patients who have got severe airflow obstruction is by the gas dilution because the, the gas is not able to equilibrate so that is why the concentration of the gas on, on the basis of which you are calculating the volumes are going to be underestimating the lung volumes are there any contraindications i have already spoken to you the, the 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 main thing is when the patient is not ready to get into the box so confusion poor coordination body cast patients who are like on the stretchers patients with claustrophobia and of course extremely obese people 200 and above kg they cannot also get into it but up to 150 kg we have been easily doing it into the body box they have been able to get in of course for the bigger people there might be bigger body boxes also available patients on iv drugs and uh, patients with chest tubes and uh, patients who have got uh, uh, you know a ruptured eardrum may not be able to be, get into it because the equilibration of the pressure may get disturbed uh, by sitting into the body box patients uh, who are on oxygen you need to remove the oxygen before putting them into body box so there are certain limitations for doing the body box but these are very very few in comparison to the number of patients who are fit enough and are able to get into the body box to get the uh, lung volume determinations so how is this procedure done so as i told you it's a very quick procedure you uh, put the patient into the body box let him get acclimatized to it and then only close the box once you close the box you ask him to do just quiet breathing you can see step 1 which is being shown here that the patient is having normal tidal breathing so obviously initially the patient is anxious you net let the patient get settled into the body box with the door closed and you can see that the tidal volume breathing will will establish its normal tidal volume uh, kind of a uh, breaths now at this point of time we are again recording the pressures and the flows at that point of time of this patient and then comes the second of this in this the patient is basically being now at this point of time they are going to breathe against the shutter which is uh, uh, one to two breaths against the shutter it's because we are, we are, we are going to close the shutter and going to ask the patient now to breathe at that frequency which we have been doing which is like 30 to 60 which i told you generally we keep it around 30 to 40 but previously the step one the shutter was open now in step two the shutter is closed so this patient is now trying to breathe in and breathe out normal tidal breaths but the shutter is closed so these are the measurements which are going to be taken same pressure volume measurements which are going to be taken when the shutter was open and when the shutter is closed and once the shutter is made open after the step 2 you need to do the spirometry procedure so that the calculations can be carried out and here what we require is expiratory reserve volume and an inspiratory capacity so complete spirometry procedure during step 3 so step 1 the shutter is open step 3 the shutter is open only one step which is the step 2 during which the shutter is closed so this is how it is being done you see that the patient tries to get acclimatized and gets on to his uh, normal tidal volume breaths and then they start recording and this is the normal tidal breathing recording which is seeing and the, sorry this is a normal tidal breathing and then you see the shutter is closed only few breaths are required the moment those the breaths on which the measurements have to be done are acceptable the shutter will open again and then you can do the spirometry procedure which is being shown here which is basically to look at the expiratory reserve volume and maybe the total vital capacity or an inspiratory capacity we primarily look for the ic for calculation of the total lung capacity so if what we are getting here is basically the patient into the frc erv and inspiratory capacity and all of three together will become total lung capacity so we have frc plth and we have the tlc plth and we also will have a by subtraction of the vital capacity from the total lung capacity or we we uh, we ex we uh, take out the expiratory reserve volume from the frc to get on to what we call as a residual volume so frc and inspiratory capacity and frc minus expiratory reserve volume is the residual volume and add on ic it becomes total lung capacity so that completes the entire lung volumes and capacities which we need to understand in daily practice so this is how you can see the patient is sitting inside the first thing is that we have the 
a normal breathing in which we have the mouth pressure which is occurring at the functional residual capacity and we have a body box which is uh, pressures is known and then we have this uh, uh, which changes with the volume so the volume change which is happening with the tidal volume we are recording and uh, this is equivalent to decrease in the box pressure because if the volume increases the pressure has to fall down and that is we, we already have calibrated with the box and then we move on to the uh, box uh, sorry the step two in which we substitute the entire process which is going on with a closed shutter so this is basically as i told you this is the three procedures which are uh, three steps which are being done here and again it is trying to show you the same thing and this now this is the step three which we are trying to show here that whatever we are getting as the frc pleth during the shutter closed we need to subtract the expiratory reserve volume from that to get the residual volume or add inspiratory capacity to that to reach the total lung capacity for that so we get all these volumes and capacities by doing the body box plethysmography and these are the changes which we are talking about boyle's law where are we adding the boyle's law this is where we are adding you can see the shutter open recording and a shutter closed report uh, recording so the shutter open and a shutter closed the re re the recordings are coming from the mouth which is taking the pressure which is equivalent to alveolar pressure right and we have a body box pressure and a body box volume so only what we need don't need uh, we, we don't have is the volume inside the lungs and that volume is what we are going to uh, calculate so we know that we had a uh, we had this p1 v1 is equal to p2 v2 so if only thing what we do not have is basically the volume inside the lungs since we change this volume this is the delta volume called and this delta volume can be calculated by the difference between the pressures and the initial uh, uh, the difference between the pressures of the box between the two procedures that is the shutter open and the shutter closed and since these are already known to us we we can easily subtract various equations so there's a long equation of body box you can see that it starts simply with p1 v1 is equal to p2 v2 and you start substituting the values which you are getting from body box to reach a level which is the lowest lower mass lower was uh, lower uh, most one which shows us that it is the delta volume change which we are going to determine the amount of volume in the lungs at the end expiration which is the frc so you calculate the frc by this formula which is the boyle's equation by just rearranging this equation you can see it you can you can uh, go through it later on to understand but this is the basic principle of it you have certain things which are known and certain things which are not known and the only thing which is not known is the volume in the lungs and for that if you have the the pressure in the mouth and you have a pressure in the box and you have a the volume in the box then you can always change it and uh, put it into the equation to get it done during the procedure so what happens is there is a volume shift which happens between the uh, panting procedure as well as the open uh, where the shutter is open versus where the shutter is closed so this shift in volume is the one uh, which are, is finally transmitted into the the box and that will change the pressure of the box so if you are putting extra volume into it then obviously the extra pressure will uh, the pressure will fall and this is being measured by the body box and we know that how much pressure is going to how much volume change is going to produce how much of pressure change so this is already known and that volume change which is happening in the box is the volume shift this is what the entire crux of the whole body box is that the shift in volume is going to be measured by changes in pressure into the box which is being uh, which is which is the p1 uh, and uh, p2 which we are going to talk about now how is how do we know that this procedure has been done correctly because it is very important that if the procedure is not done correctly then the values will not be correct so it will be coming little later to you but it will be showing you that when you were doing panting the straight line which comes us is actually what determines that you are doing the procedure properly so if this straight line doesn't come that means the procedure is not being done properly so in such situations that what happens is that the body box is, will not accept till the time this straight line comes the moment the straight line comes that the, it will accept the procedure and give you frc pleth and then the whole measurements will be taken and you can do it again after 10 seconds you can do it again after 10 seconds and you will have three values and you will take the average of the values and if the values are within 5% of all all the three then there that's acceptability basically 
and very importantly is also to look at the tangent so the tangent needs to be within 10% to be an acceptable one so you can take three values and you will take only about less than in fact uh, 30 seconds to perform this entire procedure of body box plethysmography to determine the lung volumes so this is again a pictorial or a cartoon picture which is trying to tell you that uh, there are two times at which it is done during inspiration and expiration and this the changes in the pressure which are occurring and the volume changes are being seen from the uh, from the uh, the box because box is primarily recording the same thing what is happening to the chest inside with the where the patient is sitting so you can see that this is the normal tidal volume you press the space bar and the patient starts the panting procedure so you can see that the, 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 the this is a closed shutter and it immediately changes this the, the when the shutter is open the inspiratory and expiratory loops are open like this the shutter is open the moment you close the shutter you will see that this is the straight line coming up because now there is no inspiration expiration actually happening because the shutter is closed it is only the patient who is making the efforts so if it's a straight line so that means there was no leak and this teaser has been done properly shutter will open and you will perform the expiratory reserve volume erv uh, from here and then you will have this slow vital capacity to get into your inspiratory capacity so that you can calculate all the volumes and this is how the picture will look like at your screen so you can see that normal tidal volume you can see that one procedure shutter closed second procedure shutter closed third procedure shutter closed and then followed by the spirometric procedure tracings which are done and for every shutter close you can see that there is the straight line which is telling you this is the maneuver that it was properly done it is acceptable and then what you are getting here is the airway resistance loops which i am going to talk about later what you are seeing here is your typical spirometry graph and this is this is the entire thing which you will be seeing on your the uh, on your screen at the when you are doing this uh, body box plethysmograph right another thing that we not only do the lung volumes we but we also do the airway resistance by the body box and that you have seen in your previous picture that whether you want it or you don't want it there is no extra procedure required in the same procedure where you have done this uh, this the closed shutter mechanism we have been able to get the airway resistances so all these airway resistance measurements are being done in this patients and you can see that uh, these are like they are coming up where the, the there's the upper part which is uh, looking like a handle and lower part which is looking like a balloon kind of a thing and it does show that these patients have got airway obstruction in a normal one we are going to show you how it looks like and in airway obstruction this is how it looks like so we can have airway resistance which is called raw and reciprocal of airway resistance is called conductance and uh, the, the uh, and uh, what we are also looking at is that the airway resistance when it has been corrected for the lung volume it is called specific airway resistance so when airway conductance is also corrected for the lung volume it is called specific airway conductance so we have four measurements which can be done with the body box airway resistance specific airway resistance which is s raw which is corrected for the volume and then we have got go which is airway conductance and then we have a specific airway conductance which is called s go so raw s raw go and s go these are the terminologies which are being used here so we we have learned in the last seminar which was taken on in uh, impulse oscillometry and fot techniques it is basically to look at the small airways but they also look at the large airway obstructions it is not that you only look at the small airways there in fact you do the total airway resistance you do the large airway resistant you subtract the two and you get the small airway resistance so same way when we talk about the body box plethysmography we are not only looking at large airways but we can also see the small airways here so we have a raw which is of the large airways we have a raw of the small airways and that also can be calculated with the help of a body box so you can use body box also for looking at the small airway resistance so what is the concept of resistance now this is not a hoover dam which i am trying to show you the picture of that but what it is trying to tell you is that uh, when there, there is a pressure and a volume on one side and there is a pressure or volume on the other side 
and what you can see is that dam is a resistance basically and if you have to keep them both same then the pressure has to increase or, the, or, or so for, sorry pressure has to decrease or the volume has to increase to maintain that and that is the principle on which the airway resistance also works and that brings us to the next question that airway resistance needs correction for what and uh, dr radha will take this question airway resistance need uh, when you do the airway uh, resistance it needs correction for what for lung volume the air flow the airway lumen or the viscosity so by viscosity i am sure dr talwar we are talking about the quality of air which is flowing so it has it has characteristics like uh, 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 viscosity and uh, uh, the, the the density of the air everything comes yes. in yes yes so shall we go to the polls now yes dr rana yes and uh, the answer is uh, to the tune of more than 80% have opined that airway resistance needs correction for lung volume very good so i think the message had gone very clear and it makes my life very simple because all others are determinants of airway resistance we can't correct them but if the airway resistance is abnormal it can be because of the flow characteristics it can be because of the diameter it can be because of the density or viscosity and we know the reynolds number so this is again one of the physics law which is going to be applied here which we are going to talk about but what we are what we are saying is that uh, airway resistance as the lung volume increases decreases as the lung volume decreases the airway resistance decreases so if you are determining the airway resistance and you do not know at what volume you have done then that airway resistance will be of no uh, significance so that is what we we are talking about you can see that the airway resistance is decreasing as the lung volumes are more as the lung volumes go less the airway resistance increases but when you do it uh, correct it for the lung volumes then you almost get a straight line you can see that rv frc and tlc so that is why it is called specific airway resistance so specific airway resistances and conductances are the ones which have been corrected for the lung volumes so these are the various definitions so airway resistance is basically an indicator of obstruction it is inversely related to lung volume and it has got a high variability on the other hand when we talk about airway conductance this is just another way of presenting airway resistance it is a reciprocal of rho and it is directly proportional to lung volume rather than in inversely proportional because it is the opposite of airway resistance so when we correct it for the volume then you call it specific resistance or specific conductance so these are the basic terminologies which are being used here and body box records it on simultaneously on the same breath which you are doing the test so it records the air flow against the box pressure with the shutter open and with the shutter uh, mouth pressure uh, with the box pressure or the shutter closed so you can see these are the two graphs you can see box pressure and air flow box pressure and mouth pressure so these are the transducers which are already calculating them and the box pressure is already available so what you need is a flow and a mouth pressure which is being determined by the transducer so these two values will come and you can see the tangents are going opposite here so these are the tangents and these are the these are the measurements which are being taken at the time when we are doing the frc plet and that's what i was trying to tell you that if they are straight lines and the tangent is about 10 10 degrees that means the test is appropriately being done so these are the airway loops or the resistant loops which we get so you had seen in the previous picture i showed you a loop which almost look like this so normally the airway resistances are same when you are going in that is inspiration or expiration but whenever there is a airway obstruction the loop opens up so you can see the inspiration and you can see the expiration during the expiration there is more obstruction and during the inspiration there is less obstruction so the loop has opened so you can see that if it is happening in the large airways this is how it looks like if there is a chronic one chronic air flow limitation like patients with emphysema you can see that it opens up and balloons up in the lower part like this so it's almost looking like a golf handle this is something which is very specific what we see in patients with emphysema 
or the patients who have got permanent chronic airflow limitation where there's a lot of airway remodeling which has happened and extended into the small airways also. So this is the end of the inspiration. You can see that very clearly and you can also see that this is the, uh, the start of the expiration. So maximum amount of problem is occurring towards the end of the inspiration and towards the beginning of the expiration. So this is where the small airways do reside actually. So you can see that uh, this is this is the kind of obstruction which we get, uh, the loop which we get in patients with chronic airflow limitation. What about upper airway obstruction? So you can see that the normal loop, which is like this with a tangent of 10 has got shifted and it is almost looking like an S-shaped loop. And this is a typical loop. If you see that, you will diagnose an upper airway obstruction in a patient who has undergone the body box uh, plethysmography. So then a word about what is the specific airway resistance. As I told you, specific is when we have corrected it for the volume. And they are called a specific effective airway resistance, which is S-REF, uh, or total airway resistance, which is called R-TOT. And there is also when it is done at resistance 0.5, then which is called 0.5. So you can see this. This is the, the same air patient with the airway obstruction. You can see. You can see the inspiration coming up here and then ballooning up. And then this is the expiration. So these are basically looking at large airways. This is looking at small airways, which is SR dot. And SR 0.5 is for the large airways. I think you will remember uh, in your iOS, we have R5 and R20s. So where we have uh, actually the R0.5 and we have R dot, uh, uh, which is uh, basically for the small airways. So there are little different terminologies out here. But uh, these are the specific airway resistance loops. So we may not have actually, you know, the predicted normals. So what we go by the values of more than 0.3. So anything which is more than 0.3 is abnormal. Similarly, we are also doing in the in the iOS, anything which is like above 0.9 or above 1 will be considered as increase in airway resistance in the in, in iOS also. So by and large, even if we do not have the predicted normals, we have what the normal should be like that. So if it is more than 0.3, we know that it is abnormal uh, airway resistance in an individual patient. And there is also one extra type of loop, which is four number, which I haven't shown you before, where, the, you know, the inspiration starts and there's a drop in the flow and then there is an expiration. So there is a drop in the flow. So this is typically happens because of the closure of airways. Then the patient is taking a deep inspiration and starts an expiration. The, the inspiration stops suddenly because there is no flow happening because the airways have closed. This happens in obesity. So this is typical of obesity. But this tangent changes some, some, you know, you can confuse between the two, but you can see the tangent changes and tangent is airway obstruction basically. So if the tangent remains the same, but it balloons up like this, then it is obesity related. So that that's the difference between the airway obstruction and the obesity related decrease in your uh, FVC and FEV1 and lung volumes. Sometimes it gives a lot of confusion about uh, obesity related changes in spirometry and lung volumes versus uh, a truly obstructive disease. And many a times there may be asthma and uh, obesity both together where you really need to find out what is actually causing more trouble to the individual patient. So that brings us to a one question. And uh, now there are quick questions which uh, Dr. Radha will take. Yes. Uh, so, so the nine questions. Radha, you can take all four questions because they are all together. Okay. On yes. Uh, so we would just, I would just look at the poll result and then we can keep on discussing. Uh, Dr. Salwar has already shown various loops. And here we are looking at whether you have understood. So what is loop one suggestive of? Is it the normal airway resistance? It's the large airway obstruction. It's the, is it suggestive of emphysema or is it suggestive of upper airway obstruction? And the answer is very obvious. So I'm not going to give much time to that. Uh, and uh, there is a clue also, which I would not read out unless I have seen the poll results. Yes. And the clue was, it was the first, uh, uh, you know, first loop. So the answer was obvious that it would be a normal. And uh, luckily, uh, you have got 100% answer for that. So Dr. Yeah. Salwar, they so say... I think, I, think, I think Dr. Radha, I am very happy that we are yes. in sync with our audience, that yes. they have understood this concept. So this, my idea of showing you the loops was that even without looking at the values, you just look at the loop and you diagnose, oh, this is this, finish. There is no nothing else required. 
so that's what i was trying to tell you we are very scared of body works in fact body works makes life very very easy for us so that was the answer so this is correct because this is steep closed and straight 10 degree tangent steep and closed and straight very good so we move on to the next one yes and the tenth question is the second loop is indicative of what normal airway resistance large airway emphysema and upper airway obstruction and here also the answer is obvious but i'm sure these questions are framed by dr salwar just to emphasize and we learn to pick up the diagnosis just looking at the loop which are formed on the screen or which have been printed in the report if the report is coming from outside am i correct dr salwar absolutely dr radha when i first saw the uh, you know the research body box in 1983 in patel chest so i was told you know that uh, look at these loops they are looking so good they are looking so easy you can diagnose it but i didn't understand a word of that at that point of time <laughs> because i didn't know and, what the loops mean yes and again you score 100% for uh, uh, not only for this wonderful class but for years spent in doing body box and right. you get 100% the loop to is definitely so it is opened up Yes. So this is, see why it is opened up is that the air flow is not normal during inspiration and expiration in this group of patients because there is obstruction. So if there is obstruction, the obstruction is not going to be flat during inspiration and expiration. That's the most important part. The 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 resistance will change between inspiration and expiration. The and that is what is the crux of opening up of this loop. So inspiratory as well as the expiratory loops have opened. They are not over each other. and the tangent has changed which shows it is taking time for the loop to form so the air flows are taking time to go through the airways so that means they are obstructed and the airway resistance since it is changing between inspiration and expiration the loop has opened thank you very much for getting 100% correct on this also so yes. we move on to I, the I and uh, we go to the another question and of course it is with the loop and which what does the third loop indicate so now that the normal airway resistance is taken away you have again a choice of large airway emphysema and upper airway obstruction and i'm not going to wait much for the poll results uh, let's look at yes so loop 3 is indicative of and everybody has selected emphysema another 100% for dr salwar so i think this this basically is trying to show you why the loop is so big is that it is taking time there so the air flows are taking time to come from there so that means it is a heterogeneity and there is a, air, a alveolar spaces which are slowly putting their air into uh, they are pushing the air towards the airways for the expiratory procedure so that is why you can see that the inspiratory part is looking okay it is the expiratory part perhaps which is taking very long time so this typically happens because of the trapped air in emphysema patients so very correctly so that's i think the last loop yes and uh, loop 5 is indicative of so you have already explained let us see whether they still remember or they are lost amongst all the loops from 1 to 5 and loop 5 is indicative of oh so yes uh, 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 can we call this a waning effect dr talwar maybe wrong yes. no no it's not wrong but i would have loved to you to get uh, another 100% but uh, upper airway obstruction has been set to the tune of 55% whereas 37 to 38% feel that it is emphysema okay so i think uh, i need to explain this i didn't explain this that's the reason see now you can see that large airway obstruction whatever you are getting here the loop is open like this only but the loop is showing that see the more the loop goes towards the right side more is the obstruction so obstruction is very much severe in one part here and not here in the lower part of it so this is actually which is showing that obstruction is not uniform and it is changing so that is why what is what we are talking about is that this is a situation which is upper airway resistance or upper airway uh, obstruction which is being trying to show even the specific resistance loops look like that now we come to the another question you know that's uh, this is uh, a patient in which we took the loops at 6 months 
and you can see the loop at baseline and you can see the loop after six months and uh, uh, you have to comment upon what is happening here so yes. dr tala will take this uh, i think probably this uh, has been framed only to see that uh, if it is done as a follow up how would you interpret uh, the loop that you are getting in a particular patient and whether the airway obstruction is same the airway obstruction has worsened or airway obstruction has decreased uh so that is the question and uh, let us look at the poll okay so we have uh, interesting results i am sure dr talwar that our technical team would be saying that i am not giving much time to the audience but uh, since this is interactive and uh, you have explained so much i don't think they should take lot of time so what are our results are more than 60% say that airway obstruction is worse and there are 20% people who are going in favor of same or it has decreased okay. so over to you now i think very important to understand is that you are correct that there is an airway obstruction the only thing is that the loop has become much bigger now right. so if the obstruction will go away then the loop will actually close so that is why it is showing that if the loop has become so open so that means the airway obstruction has become worse if this loop has would have collapsed after 6 months that would have shown that we have given a very good therapy to the patient and patient has clearly improved so that's what it is trying to show you now you look at it the loop is like this and then you give bronchodilator and the loop gets closer so this shows that the the airway obstruction has decreased this is response to bronchodilators on the other hand if you give the bronco provocation test like methacolin you can see the loop is here like this and it becomes much bigger so that means the airway actually has become now much more uh, narrower and the airway resistance has increased so this is this is the entire thing that again not only you are able to diagnose but if you had two different loops you can even just compare the loops and see whether the patient is improving or not so it is it is very very simple cooperation free one look and diagnose and you can even do the airway resistance loops and airway resistances for the therapy and the follow up effect so then comes the question that is the body box better so in the then spirometry also so there are instances where the spirometry may be normal and only the body box which we, we will be looking at the specific airway resistance loops which will be picking it up and another important point that we need to you know look at fev1 we need to look at those parameters for reversibility there are hard core parameters when we look at the airway resistance in fact it is much more sensitive to changes so you may get a lot of partial reversibility by looking at 20% change in airway resistance and more than 50% when there is a huge uh, uh, reversibility and all these things may occur when the spirometry actually does not show any reversibility significant so what i'm trying to say is that by looking at airway resistance response to bronchodilators we are able to pick up many more cases of reversible bronchodilator effect then we are see by the spirometry the reason being that when we do airway resistance it is not only the resistance part which is the air flow resistance which we are picking up by spirometry but the lung hyperinflation is also being looked after so that is the reason why the body box so that is why you can see that the response is not only because the airway resistance has gone down but also the hyperinflation which was because of the obstruction has also been taken care of by bronchodilator and that does happen but we can't pick it up by the spirometry alone so that's why it is better so you can actually uh, uh, do the airway resistance uh, beyond the spirometry also for the evaluation of air flow limitation looking at bronchial uh, bronchodilators looking at their uh, hyper reactivity by looking at the fall particularly with exercise that's also we do it we don't do methacolin but we do exercise and it is more sensitive than fev1 at that point of time and of course uh, Uh, it can be done for uh, looking at which type of uh, obstruction it is it is peripheral central or it is like emphysema type all these things can be also looked after by the this so then we comes to the last part of the presentation which is the interpretation of lung volumes so any volume which is below 80% of whether it is rv or tlc is abnormal if it is more than 120% that is also abnormal so high lung volumes more than 120% or low lung volumes when they are less than 80% and uh, similarly we also calculate hyperinflation by doing rv tlc ic tlc ratios and they also need to be between 80 to 120% so if they are less than 80 
then obviously low ratios and if they are more than 120 they are showing that there is high ratios suggesting air trapping or hyperinflation uh, as far as airway resistance and airway conductance are concerned so airway resistance has little more variability so if it has to be reported abnormal it has to be above 130 percent of predicted or more than 0.3 that is the value which i told you which we generally take in the labs if we don't have the predicted normals from our own population however conductance since this is a reciprocal of that then it's more accurate so that is why uh, the airway conductance people would like to use more because this goes same way 80 percent so anything which is above 80 percent or below 80 percent is significant for the airway conductance so then we come to the lung volumes which is the functional residual capacity so you can see that the functional residual capacity is where the elastic recoil of the chest wall and the lungs which are in the opposite directions balance each other so the chest wall which is trying to open up and the lungs which are trying to collapse so at a point when both of them negative each other and become zero is called the frc level so you can see that the frc can increase or decrease because of either the chest wall conditions or because of the lung conditions so frc will increase when there is more gas trapping in the airways or there is stick lung diseases and frc will fall then there is a chest wall which is uh, less compliant. There is a reduced uh, uh, recoil of the chest wall, stiff chest wall, like we get it in rheumatoid arthritis or conditions who have got uh, people who have got a very tight chest skin diseases which causes scars on the chest. So it decreases. So similarly, if the lung is less compliant, like pulmonary fibrosis or there is a collapse of the lung, again, the FRC will fall down. So you need to understand this graph very carefully that the FRC determines a delicate balance between the chest wall and the lung compliances. So the recoil of these two, two uh, uh, structures will determine your FRC. So if it goes above, you can think about it that if this entire line is to be pushed up, there is something which is happening to the chest wall or something happening to the lungs basically. And if you bring it down, then again, these are the two factors which are going to be determined. So either the lungs are going to become more compliant or less compliant. So you can see that here the lungs are less compliant, here the lungs are more compliant. Similarly, the chest wall in the other way around. So trying to balance each other and this is the FRC. Then comes the total lung capacity. So again, you can see that what determines the total lung capacity. So you can see that this is the total lung capacity at which point of time you can see that the, the, the lung compliance is all the, the lung recoil is maximally that at that point of time. So it is the again the, 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 the chest, sorry, and this is the chest wall which is going up. So what limits the total lung capacity is the compliance of the lung, not the chest wall. So if anything which is going to increase this, it has to do with the lung compliance. So TLC increase when their lungs are more compliant. That happens stimulatively when there is airway trapping happening like in patients with obstructive airway diseases, asthma and COPD. On the other hand, if you look at the lower end, which is the total lung capacity here, what is happening is that again, the, the, it is basically the lung compliance, which is going to either go down, which happens in pulmonary fibrosis or chest wall, which is primarily related to obesity or muscle weakness. Then we look at the residual volume. The residual volume is the lower part of the curve. You can see that at this point of time, it is the chest wall compression. You can see the blue line. This is the chest wall compression. So this is what is going to determine the residual volume. So the chest, it, it is going to be increased in air trapping and uh, again, the emphysema like asthma, emphysema syndromes, or it is going to be decreased further because of the either the chest wall recoil or because of the lung recoil, which is the pulmonary fibrosis. So if in by and large, if you look at it, the, the FRC and the residual volume, the two lung volumes which we are talking about, they are decreased in restrictive lung diseases and they are increased in obstructive airway diseases. So, so you, you, the TLC may not be high in all of them, but TLC will be definitely low in patients who have got the restrictive lung diseases. But decreased TLC, decreased FRC and decreased RV, all three together, typically goes with restrictive lung diseases. However, increase in FRC and increase in residual volume typically goes towards the obstructive lung diseases. So you can actually now the lung volumes, you will be able to separate out in a patient who has got a mixed defects on spirometry 
or not clear defects on spirometry as to is it a predominantly obstruction or predominantly restriction or it is both of them. So when we interpret the lung volumes, as I told you, the normal range 80 to 120, we look at the TLC. If TLC is high, that means that there is going to be air trapping or hyperinflation. If it is going to be low, then that is a restrictive defect. And normal can be there in obstructive airway diseases or it can be a normal uh, lungs altogether. So normal TLC is compatible with both. So then we look at RV and RV TLC ratios and also ERV and FRC. And again, they can be either high, low or normal. And they will be used primarily in obstructive and restrictive diseases, which we are going to see later. And once we have diagnosed that it is obstructive or restrictive or mixed disease, we also try to see all the volumes are proportionately decreased or they are disproportionately. Because if they are happening disproportionately, then they are pointers towards the certain lung diseases which needs to be considered. And that brings us to question number 14, which is a case study, which you can see. Uh, now that you have looked at all the loops and you know about the values which are normal, increased or decreased, this is a case study. And here we really go on to the practical hands-on which you can look at the reports generated. So look at the values which are already kept in the box and comment whether it is normal, obstructive, restrictive or mixed. Look at it, the FRC plex is given at 99 of the percent of the predicted. Residual volume is 113. Total lung capacity is 87. And RVTLC ratio is 124. So shall we go to look at the poll results in the case study? I think people would take a little time. Okay. I think what they need to understand is that when they are looking for first thing is the spirometry and then come to the lung volume. So, so spirometry, you start with FEV1 over FVC ratio. Yes. And then second is the FVC. So if both of them are normal, then obviously you know what you are looking for in the lung volumes. So go ahead and look at your total lung capacity and you look at your RV and uh, you, are, you are looking at those values. 80 to 120 okay. is the values which I have already told you. Uh, it's, it's almost equivalent to a normal tensive of 120 by 80. Should we reverse the figures? Very good. Okay. Good analogy, Dr. Radha. I didn't think about it. Thank you very much. Very good analogy. It, it would be very easy to remember, you know, very 120. Easy. Yes. Um, so what we have got is, um, it's almost 30% to normal, obstructive and mixed. With almost uh, no polling for restricted. So at least we have been able to drive in the fact that if TLC is normal, the restriction is ruled out. Yes. I think that 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 message has gone very, very clear in this. But if some people have taken obstructive, then I would say that uh, the only indicator to some extent would be that RV TLC ratio is 124.8%. Yes. So you may be also correct there because there is only one indicator here in the lung volumes. And that's the idea to highlight the study that even in normal spirometry, sometimes you wonder that the patient doesn't have any obstruction. You would either look, uh, try to look for airway resistance or you would like to look at this RVTLC ratio. RVTLC ratio means uh, there is a trapping. If there is a trapping means the amount of air which is going in is not coming out. So that means some expiratory airflow limitation must be there. That is why there is air trapping which is happening in this patient. So I think uh, most of you are correct here and I'm very happy that nobody said it is restrictive. So we go on to the next one. Dr. Uh, and here also then we have uh, the loops and the values which you have. And uh, choices are of course same, the normal, obstructive, restrictive or mixed. And you can look at the values and you would find that FRC plus residual volume, total lung capacity, it's almost uh, increased and it's 157, 203. RVTLC ratio is also 184. So let us look at uh, what the audience has pulled for. Okay. So are, am I at the case study too? Yes. And uh, okay. So, Dr. Talwar, you may uh, need to revise uh, a little <laughs> because, see, the polling has said that 60% of them say that this is normal and only 40% of them say that this is obstructive. 
and none of them say it is restrictive and mixed so at least again at one point i think today is the message which is going very clearly is that we are on to the advanced test but we really no need to go back to the spirometry dr radha that is very essential outcome i think yes yes and, so normal 106% people are correct that need this can't be restrictive it can't be mixed because there's no restriction here that the total lung capacity is normal but yes. very importantly uh, yeah yes ma'am by that by the time we were discussing about uh, those values as well as the spirometric so and the poll was ongoing i thought that we should hasten up a little and uh, we would give you more than 70% that uh, they have voted for obstructive airway disease few of them think that it is normal few think it is restrictive and uh, at the ikka duka 5% say it's a mixed one so i think uh, a lot of you have picked up obstruction because i think the most important thing first thing i think in the spirometry which we teach is that look at the fev1 over fvc ratio 32.6 30.82 so this is less than 80% or predicted normal whatever you want to use what it is trying to tell you is that there is clearly airway obstruction there yes. so there's no and doubt it, about it there is airway obstruction then you I, one. i would add another clue to dr talwar's question is in the last question there was a red box for values here there is no red box and so you should also look at spirometry very minutely and then go to the value and i will I, i will request the all audience the way you have recognized the loops of airway resistance please also remember the loops of the you know spirometry so this loop is very very typical dog tail appearance which we see in severe air flow limitation so i think this is very very clear which you are seeing out here so i, I think if you look if you don't even look at the spirometry i would have said okay there is a obstruction here and then i look at the tlc so there is no restriction here and then i look at the rv tlc ratios which are huge which is trying to show that there is a very significant of amount of air left inside the lungs so that much can be easily said so i i can still go on to this question which is again a very simple question here that now you have seen i have spoken about rv tlc ratios so is it air trapping or hyperinflation or i do not know so the idea of this question is primarily to see that how do you define hyperinflation or air trapping so these are the two terminologies which are being used and one is trying to tell us that the airway spaces have become permanently <laughs> enlarged and in one they are still re reversible and uh, there is only trapping there so dr radha this is uh, a dr. yes so dr talwar do you want to emphasize on two different type of obstructive airway diseases yeah so i it's coming in the next Because slide the copd is uh, you can, can discuss this ma'am you can discuss okay. Uh, no no i'm not discussing i'm i'm just asking whether you wanted to give that insight to our audience absolutely that simply labeling because we are seeing the fvc reversibility of 14.5% yes. it is more than 200 ml yes uh, so let us look at the results what we have and uh, 73% so almost to the tune of 75% say this is a trapping and very few that is 25% one fourth say that it is hyperinflation nobody said i do not know no <laughs> no <Good>. that is <laughs> okay that's good yeah so you know the, the the primarily the the definition of air trapping or hyperinflation whatever you want to use is rv tlc ratio if rv tlc ratio is raised we are or rv is raised along with it that is what we are looking at basically that there is more air left inside the lungs after the complete exhalation process so when the total lung capacity remains normal that is called air trapping because this is like not a permanent thing which has happened on the other hand when the tlc is also increased that shows that there is a permanent increase in the air spaces sizes which happens only in high emphysema so what 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 we would try to look at it again in this situation that what was the tlc of the patient you can see 106% so if the tlc is normal this is not an emphysema if it is an emphysema it may be very early but by and large if you see reversibility and you if you see tlc normal so even the rv is 200% and rv tlc ratio is 184% which is like very severe amount of air left behind it is not because of permanent damage it is because of air trapping 
and this picture is suggestive of asthma that's what i think ma'am was talking about and how much of air trapping is there can also be quantified by the severity and anything above 170% is called severe since this patient had 180% 85% so this patient has got very severe air trapping which is there so in such patients if you do not get a typical bronchodilatory response in fev1 which you can see 8.1% and you can see from 0.80 to 0.87 which is just about 70 ml so what you would be interested in knowing is after the bronchodilator this air trapping did decrease or not if that decreases that shows that bronchodilators are effective by simple spirometry you can say that okay it's not very effective only the fvc has improved many a times people will say that fvc improves also because this patient has very severe chronic air flow limitation which almost is behaving like a copd patient in this situation so that's the idea we move on to case study number 3 and in case 3 you have all values given and look at these values of our uh, frc plate again the red line there is a red line, there. There a red line. <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, do you mean to say it's a clue okay a so is it normal here. start from here okay it is is it normal obstructive restrictive mix see the choices are going to be same you have to look at the reports look at the values look at the curves if at all it is shown and then uh, give your opinion so uh, as the polling is going on shall we look at the results now yes sure ma'am yes um as far as as till now ye to jaise poll ke results jaisa ho gaya abhi <laughs> अभी अभी जो आए हैं यस तो अभी अभी जो आए हैं तो 75 परसेंट ऑफ देम से दैट दिस इज रिस्ट्रिक्टिव एंड 12 परसेंट ईच से दैट इट इज नॉर्मल एंड ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव सो ओवर टू यू डॉक्टर तलवार ओके थैंक यू मैम देन आई थिंक द एंटायर मॉड्यूल has driven in the restriction much better than obstruction that's what i am trying to say but i think uh, body volumes are not only for restriction they are also for obstruction in this you what you are seeing is actually this line was to tell you that the ratio is normal 83.68 84.27 so if the ratio is normal it practically excludes out obstruction so at least you should not talk about obstruction and then you look at quickly at tlc which is 45% so obviously the lungs are restricted the tlc is low frc and then you look at the frc is reduced the the r residual volume is reduced and rv tlc ratio is reduced so everything is reduced here so this is a typical restrictive defect what we are seeing so if two third or rather three fourth of them have said it correctly so i think 80% we have been able to drive in the lung volumes and yes. interpretation of the lung volumes yes so again the restriction uh, also has be severity assessment can be done and less than 60 is considered as severe and this is on tlc percent predicted or tlc so your our patient had 45% so again the report will be severe restrictive ventilatory defect in that individual patient yes so in that, fact all values were decreased in the last report yeah. so it should it was very been. systematically all of them was reduced yes and now we come to another question what is the cause of isolated reduction in the erg values is it pulmonary fibrosis is it chest wall deformity obesity or hyperinflation so if there are mistakes in this they will be acceptable it is acceptable but uh, i feel uh, that whenever a question is framed it's not only the answer that you look at but how the question is framed that is also important Uh, you get clues from many things you know lung volumes are normal only erv is reduced yes. so this is like something which you really need to think about it that what is resetting the whole thing yes you have seen that how, what what determines the erv is actually the frc so yes. something which is changing the frc and what FRC. changes the frc that's the very important aspect without yes. changing anything else yes because lungs are and healthy Yes, the chest wall is healthy. There is only something which is abnormal there. Yes, and which you had quoted when you I explained about this. I so particularly that's remember. Time uh, of that uh, FVC curve. Yes. And uh, you know, 
45 percent. Uh, I, I think I'm looking at the answer more, and 45 percent of them say that this is obesity related, and 25 each say that it is fibrosis and chest wall deformity. Okay, so I think. Uh, at least in um, uh, Dr. Radha, 50% of people we have been able to not only get to the lung volumes, but mm -hmm. also in depth the understanding of the lung volumes that uh, yes. they could make out that it is the because just there is a, a, a resetting of that point which is called FRC point because of the obesity factor. That is why only ERV is getting disturbed out here. And uh, these are the things which are, this is a picture which is trying to tell you, you know, in restrictive diseases, the volumes are reduced. But in, they may be out of proportion. Some of them are reduced much more in comparison to other. And that will tell you a clue as to what is the cause of this restriction. Particularly like it is the chest wall. Is it in the lungs related? It is the muscle related. So these things can also be closely looked into at the like, you know, if you see the TLC is reduced in all three pulmonary fibrosis, neuromuscular diseases and severe obesity. TLC is the same. It is the proportion of an individual lung volume which is reduced, which is trying to tell you what it is caused. All of them proportionately reduce pulmonary fibrosis. In neuromuscular diseases, you will see that because the, the, the muscles are so weak, the chest wall, which is, you know, trying to keep the, everything is into place is bigger. So obviously it is the residual volume which has increased here. And similarly, if you look at the obesity factor, the, it is the expiratory reserve volume which has almost collapsed in such a situation. So these are the kind of things which will try to solve out many other things. You can see the obesity lung volumes and we move on to question number 19. So quickly, we have two more questions, Dr. Radha, and then we will take the question answers. Yes. Uh, so look at the loops and look at the volume. And this is the fourth case for you. And just comment whether it is normal, whether it is obstructive pattern, whether it shows a restrictive disease whether it's a mixed disease or whether these changes are all non-specific. You have both the loops as well as the values and uh, you can see that the values, I, I'm giving a clue. They are in the tune, they, are, they look like, I, I shouldn't be saying normotensive, but they are in the range of 120, 80. Uh, so it should be easier for them to come in. Look at the values. So I think the, the idea of bringing in this this uh, study was very important because we look at FVC reduced, we look at FEV1 over FVC ratio normal, and we say it is a restrictive defect. Yes. And I think in the beginning itself, we said that the restriction must be confirmed on the total lung capacity. Okay. Like in this case, we have 84% total lung capacity. That's what ma'am said, between 80 to 120, everything 80 to 120. So all lung volumes are normal. So restriction is practically ruled out in this case. Yes. And uh, in the poll, they say that uh, it is a mixed pattern as voted by 50% and 25% each say that it is normal and a restrictive. So I think nobody knows about non-specific because that's what we wanted to highlight here. That you can see the ratio is normal, FEV1 over FVC ratio and TLC is normal. So obstruction and restriction both are ruled out. So there is no question of it is mixed also. So only thing you are left behind is, is it normal or is it like I do not know what is happening. Now for calling it normal, you have to say, okay, the FVC is coming only 70%. Can FVC be only 70%? It can be. There is no doubt. But what we call it specifically is a non-specific ventilatory abnormality. So we are not getting a clear picture of obstruction or restriction, but there is something which is low in this situation. It can happen in mild asthma. It can happen in mild combined disorders also like bronchiectasis. It can happen in children and young females. It can happen when the asthma is well treated and everything is normal in such situations. So it is such kind of an abnormality where you will again require more tests to be performed. So if we get something like this, I will look at airway resistance. I will look at impulse oscillometry for peripheral airway resistance. I will ask for a diffusion study to see whether it is a, a occult uh, defects which are not being picked up where, you know, combined defect like airway as well as parenchymal, which is both of them have countered each other and led to nearly normal looking kind of a spirometry. So in such situations, we need definitely more tests required. And uh, there is another thing which is called pseudo restriction. 
and uh, this is very difficult because in some patients like obese asthmatic as i was trying to tell you it becomes very difficult to find out and if you can see this loops i think we can take it later on and you can read about it but only thing is again the, there is the, the this is the area what we are looking at isn't it expiratory reserve volume yes significantly reduced so this is what is trying to give us again a hint that there is an obesity which is very very significant here and that is what is called as a pseudo restriction and that brings us to the last case yes so here also you are given spirometry loops as well as values sir has kept all spirometric values at the base that's the change and the plethysmographic values are at the top of the screen or at the top of the report please look at the spirometry values first and then look at the plethysmographic report generated and comment whether it is normal obstructive restrictive or a mixed one and dr talwar would you want to add something when we are looking at all these things no dr radha we have come to the end of this uh, this entire series one of uh, body box plethysmography and uh, this yes. was the last question which we wanted to really address with people that uh, Yeah, look at everything actually not only the lung volumes i think lung volumes are more easy to interpret than the spirometric values so you need to consider everything together when you have lung volumes and then the perspective completely changes of course you need to interpret your values in the clinical scenarios also that's also very important part of interpret uh, i i think you have increased the difficulty index to the last question is it so we are yet to get the poll result or is it because you have switched the places or this is the most complicated question of today so i think it is fine that if people are taking time to respond yes. to this yes. but please yes. go by looking at whether there is obstruction or not and if there is obstruction then there is restriction or not restriction you will be very easily able to pick it up so if you are able to see obstruction and restriction together then you know what you are looking at so i am sure that even if you look at the loop loop will also give an idea of what is happening here and uh, also the values uh, if you have a confusion about you know fev1 over fbc ratio which one to take a take to normal so i would say that if uh, if you have the predicted normal anything below that can be taken as abnormal you have 75 here and you have 72 and 74 here which is nearly becoming normal after the this thing so it is trying to give you some hints not a very clear spirometry i think dr radha has very rightly said that i have raised the bar yes uh, and this was much needed question and uh, dr salwar gets 100 out of 100 for the restrictive pattern so the whole i think the exercise of two hours is uh, justified and uh, the aims are fulfilled am i right dr salwar yeah you are right uh, dr uh, so you know as we discussed that sometimes the reversibility has to be seen in many other parameters and i think raw is a very important parameter and reversal of a residual volume increase and all those things equally contribute to it so this is the last this is the algorithm which is trying to show you you know and uh, you can see this it will be there you can uh, see this and uh, it also incorporates the diffusion capacity so and uh, the so that is why we, we have the kco and the uh, dlco both of them are being incorporated into this algorithm so we i will cover this in the next uh, series which is going to be on the diffusion studies so shall we go ahead yeah, absolutely ma'am back to you okay so uh, this was the last slide and uh, there are few questions coming up and uh, Dr. Talwar, before I take up questions from everybody, and we must have been been getting a lot of questions. I myself have a query. Uh, one is we have, and as of now today, we have more than 400 medical colleges in our country. We have more than 4,000 pulmonologists, and almost to the tune of 200 students passing out each year. In spite of that. when i made an inquiry the number of body box which are at present incorporated is 60 60 it, it is 60 60 60 60 of yes. them already 60 is 60 and wherever they are in the institution in 60% of the cases the body box is in the department of physiology 
So see, my, 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 I do not want to make any comment. I am neither biased towards anything. Everybody is a colleague and they are helping us. My question is that in your practice, and when we look at all these figures and scenarios, what are the barriers towards accepting the body box? Looking at its utility, do you think it's the cost? Do you think that people are aware but they have some fear or are it's not user friendly? Or um, do you think that it's a costly test for the patients to be advised? What do you think it is? So um, quickly coming to this, I think Dr. Radha, this these figures were not known to me. Actually, you are you, you have really given these figures. I will note it down in my brain, and I will also ask you to message me this number because this is very very important to realize that uh, we have 60 body boxes, and uh, most of uh, uh, I think 50% of them are in the or 40% are in the physiology departments, and uh, the and wherever it is there, it is hardly ever used. For research purposes, it is must be using not in a clinical practice. So what are the barriers? So I think the first barrier uh, for not getting it would be the cost because one time cost is required. But I think in the government uh, colleges and government institutions over a period of time, this much is a one time investment because considering that maintenance cost is very low. It's a very low in comparison to the gases which are required for helium dilution and other things where, you know, it's a recurring cost. The initial cost of the equipment may be low, so it is easy to procure it, but then it is very difficult to maintain it. And I don't think so any any uh, any significant number of medical colleges or institutions will be still doing this uh, helium dilution methods or will be doing nitrogen washout methods. They are very, very difficult. So uh, I think uh, it's easy to perform. That's not an issue. Maintenance is low. Cost is high. And I think there somehow somewhere there is a there is a you know scare about interpretation of results of a body box plethysmography. I think that is very much there, and that is primarily because of the loops which you get, and also about all the values of airway resistance and airway conductance which you see, which is actually frightening to people. So they generally don't get it done because uh, if you get it done, you would like to interpret it also on that. But uh, but my say would be that, in fact, the moment you start using it, you will realize that it is so easy that why I was not using it, that it gives all the additional information which I like. So why do only spirometry? Let the patient undergo spirometry and as well as the, the lung volumes in one go all together. And it is also giving us airway resistance and airway conductance. So in, in a way, you can look at much more physiologically what is happening to the patient and will be able to better make the diagnosis even when the spirometry doesn't help in those situations it will be of great use so i think that's that's what the answer to your question is do you, do, do you think people are too comfortable with spirometry and do not want to step out of their comfort zone i i agree with you dr radha but the uh, interpretation of spirometry has been more wrong than the interpretation yes. of lung volume yes yes, yes. Uh, i i agree to it uh, so uh, perhaps after a year or so if we are to repeat uh, another webinar on body plethysmograph, uh, let us hope that whatever efforts we have taken today, we are not aiming at increase in the number of body box, but we are in looking at increase in better utilization of existing body boxes. And I, right? I would also say, Dr. Radha, that I know a couple of physiology departments are also on this webinar that if they have yes. the equipment, I think opening it up to the, let the clinical work be done so that there will be more patients referred from the clinical departments to be done, it will be much better because they will be also not only getting more experience, but also yes. their colleagues will be helped by that. Uh, that is, that's what I always say, that they are not only our friends and colleagues, but they are our partners too. And we can think of many more ways of utilizing them. So another question which has come to my mind is, uh, we have seen and you know that uh, obesity is rampant and there are people who undergo bariatric surgery also. So in your experience, uh, do you think that body plethysmography is a good way to decide which of these patients should go for surgery? Because there, you can make out so many predictions by doing blood body plethysmography. I think you are very correct, ma'am, because, uh, uh, you know, the dyspnea in the patients who have got uh, morbid obesity may not be always because the lungs are getting compressed in them. 
Yes. So it it is it is the likelihood increases, and obviously as the BMI goes high, then obviously the lung volumes start coming down. But initially values like thirty, thirty five, thirty six, thirty seven, thirty eight, it is not that every patient is going to be affected. So if you are able to identify those patients in which obesity is predominantly playing role in the entire lung function uh, structure of the patient. then these are the groups which can be targeted that weight reduction is the strategy for them to improve whether they do it by a or they do it by b but that is what is going to achieve certainly sometimes we find that people have got a bmi of 35 and their lung functions are perfectly normal so if these are the kind of candidates if they have a breathlessness we will try to look for other causes of breathlessness in them right uh, there is another question which has come from uh, dr mishra from nagpur he says that when performing complete lung function test that is spirometry which is pre and post dlco and plethysmography what is the preferred order of performing these tests in relation to each other and second to it is what is the timing of bronchodilator response to be done after this test okay yeah. so i think it's a it's a very good question and i was expecting this that if you are like asking for a complete lung function test which is most of the you know the big uh, institutes uh, do it and uh, abroad it is like in the in if you look at the us canada or uh, european countries it is a standard there they will ask and do everything in one go so you start with a spirometry first you determine the lung volumes you are also doing a spirometry in the lung volumes and then follow by the diffusion capacity and then you give a bronchodilator and then you do a spirometry again you can also do the lung volumes after that but then it becomes very expensive for us to perform it that way so generally we try to not do that way but definitely diffusion is not required in the pre or the post stage but lung volumes definitely will show reduction in air trapping and uh, uh, air trapping by the bronchodilator response so many a times we do uh, incorporate it but the standard protocol what what we follow is spirometry followed by the uh, the lung volumes and then we end up with a diffusion study and we give a bronchodilator and come back many a times uh, you know uh, there we, we would like to do the lung volumes also and sometimes not the diffusion capacity so in that case what people will do is spirometry lung volumes bronchodilator spirometry lung volumes but that becomes a little long procedure but lung volumes by a, by and large takes only about 1 minute so it's not a big problem it's only the spirometry which takes about 5 to 7 minutes each time it is to be performed so uh, this is the standard one but diffusion is generally done the pre bronchodilator uh, we have a question coming from pune dr palke wants to know can body box is useful to measure exercise performance enhancement in normal healthy person okay so uh, increase in exercise capacity in an individual person so i think that is the webinar 3 and 4 uh, which are on cardio pulmonary exercise testing so that's precisely what it does but uh, well looking at you know the exercise capacity is also determined by the hyperinflation in the lung so rv and rv tlc ratio and inspiratory capacity so these are the various parameters if they improve then they can give an indicator that the patient should be able to do more exercise so we use it primarily as as a as a measure to look for increase in exercise capacity no so because exercise capacity increase means that either you have more endurance time that is you can do exercise for more period of time or you are able to do more exercise because the intensity of exercise has increased so either time which is the duration or the intensity so that is what is going to tell us the exercise capacity has improved we do not do that we do we require vo2 max for that we do not do uh, by this methods but then patients of copd like for instance when they improve it is their inspirit or bronchial asthma patients or copd obstructive airway disease once the inspiratory capacity increases the airway trapping or hyperinflation decreases these patients will be able to translate into a more exercise capacity it does increase in fact endurance time increases so the exercise time increases so indirect way but not directly okay and uh, we have another question coming from uh, mumbai dr pico has asked is it advisable to have body box with diffusion 
or only body box is enough to do the lung volume see you don't need diffusion capacity for the lung volume so if you want lung volumes only so you need a body box spirometer is going to come along with it only diffusion you can add on at the moment or you can add on later on because your complete test will not be uh, you know uh, comprehensive unless and until we do the diffusion capacity so what i feel is uh, the best is to upfront ask for a body box and a diffusion because spirometry is anyway going to be incorporated into that okay and uh, there is another question which i also wanted to ask uh, one is about uh, now that we are in this era people have become you know Uh, uh more thinking about it uh what about the cross infections to be avoided in the body box that's, that's one thing very... and secondly uh, how many times or when do you calibrate the machine or whether do it do you do it daily before you do the test yeah. so as far as the calibration is concerned every day in the morning when you come and start your machines then you calibrate the machine and body box is very important to be calibrated actually because volume and pressure of the box is something which is going to determine everything so you need to do it every day there are automatic ways of doing it it is very easy so that's not a big deal the technician will come switch on the machine and he will first calibrate it and then start the day i think the very important question is what about the covid times at that point of time will you be able to do or not so we know that all aerosol generating procedures are not to be done now the spirometry is one of them so and if you use body box for lung volumes alone you won't be able to do it actually because again the spirometry will be required there mm -hmm. and here the spirometry is going to be done inside the box itself yeah. Yes. So the box is going to be infected if the patient is got forbidden positive. So you need to actually clean the body box entirely, desanitize the way you sanitize your operation theaters and other things. You have to wipe out everything clean and you have to do everything for that. So that's why you know we we do the, if we have to do two cases and we do not know the status of them. we will definitely be giving one hour for cleaning process and not only the cleaning process of the box and the machines. but also we have to let the air vent out from the room this is the first time our body box rooms have been opened up by the windows because otherwise these are supposed to be air conditioned you yeah. see keep them in air conditioner so we keep them we switch them off we clean off for one hour then only we'll start using it again so at least one hour between two that is what it is uh, what, what we need to do it and i think ics statement on how to perform the spirometries in this patient also has this uh, recommendation that uh, you need to take at least one hour gap where you will need to do all this cleaning procedures and uh, let the not number of patients accumulate outside the pft room so try to minimize them as as less as possible try to be very judicious to see that how your treatment is going to be changed by that and uh, of course that uh, take all precautions of sanitizing your box as well as your room wow. and how does it add to the cost of even the viral filters that you may be yes, attaching so that to the is mouth? standard see see dr radha as far as these viral and bacterial filters are concerned that is a standard in all labs we have to use it whether covid or no covid so and these are disposable ones you use them you throw them cost is about 100 rupees it's okay that 100 rupees doesn't matter because this is which is absolutely must there is a data which is emerging from europe which tells us that these filters which we are using they are also effective as a viral filters and they are good enough for basically looking at covid 19 also but since we do not have the data i do not um, i i am not confident about it i'll take all precautions for that because i don't want uh, the infections from the pft room is a, a very big issue so it should it should never happen previously we were talking about tuberculosis we were really, previously we were talking about h1n1, H1N1. So same thing happened at h1n1 times also so we had to abandon doing the lung function test for the time being and be very cautious in these patients and in fact that was the time 2009 when first time this viral filters came in that you need to use viral filters but ever since then we are using them but i am not very confident whether it's for covid 19 100% like you remove the filter because some amount of air will go outside the filters the patient is going to cough patient is going to take out from the mouth and cough so that filter is not going to take care of that so i think standard precautions needs to be taken there is another question coming from uh, dr jha from delhi he asked whether parameters and values discussed are same for children or are they different same for children are they same for children or are they different 
no they are different for children actually the, the the upper limits of the normal and the lower limits of normal are different for children so what what is like 80% for a for a for a adult might be required as a 90% for a child actually so there are generally higher values achieved for children so we generally take 10% higher values similarly rv tlc values are also considered a higher uh, uh, slab for the children but you have a predicted separately for them basically yes and um, there is another question which you have actually answered by making a presentation is but we would emphasize on it because it's very important how will you different how does the body box measurement help in cases of interstitial fibrosis with structural chest wall abnormalities both existing together i that's very difficult it's very difficult question i think because you have two this is called a complex disorder Yes. so now you have basically restriction not because of pulmonary fibrosis but also because of the chest chest wall factor yes so this is very important aspect where i will require you know the total lung capacity by two methods i will require it by the alveolar volume also to be calculated and we will also like to see the tlc by the body box because uh, in this situation uh, you know there both of them will be variable to a large extent which will tell us that what is the additional factor of the chest wall which is causing this restriction so this is a situation which is uh, uh, which is happening in uh, uh, even patients with cp uh, this um, pleuroparenchymal fibrosis ppfe actually ppfe is one condition where you will have a involvement of the chest wall as well as because it's a pleura which is just next to the chest wall that is also restricting the movements and causing restriction of tlc and the fibrosis in the lung is also causing it so here you know the the because pulmonary fibrosis will be affecting the alveolar volume so if you have a alveolar volume and you have a tlc capacity and then they are widely different that will tell you an idea that this tlc has an additional element of restriction this is primarily also seen in patients who have got severe neuromuscular weakness along with pulmonary fibrosis again the tlc will be out of proportion reduced in comparison to forced vital capacity i did not go into the details here but uh, what it is trying to tell you is fvc is reduced like consider 60% you do tlc you find it 35% it's a huge difference so normally if the difference is more than 10% there has to be an extra cause for restriction and you need to look for that so if it is like 60% fvc and tlc is coming 50% that is possible because fvc cannot give you accurate value but if it is called me 40% to more than 10% difference between two values it is trying to tell you additional cause for restriction we know there is ilt but there has to be something else along with it so there has to be a neuromuscular element or there could be a very stiff chest wall all those can be there in that individual patient and uh, we have very three important and interesting questions coming up these i know that we are beyond 9 o'clock but i would request the audience to stick to it a uh, one question is why can't we have a simpler and alternative to plethysmography like diaphragmatic ultrasound study okay i this is a, like diaphragmatic ultrasound will tell you what it will tell you diaphragmatic function only exertion yes so you can see the excursion of the diaphragm and you think that uh, you know the the lung volumes will be because will change because of that so the issue is if it is like a uh, hyperinflation the diaphragm will not move actually it will give you no idea about that mm -hmm. so in air trapping it will help you but not in the other things so ultrasound of the diaphragm is actually a very important uh, method of assessing the respiratory muscle uh, dysfunction particularly related to diaphragm where not only it is the thickness of the diaphragm which you can see movement of the diaphragm the range of motion of the diaphragm everything can be very accurately assessed so according to me ultrasound of the diaphragm is a measure of respiratory muscle dysfunction or the diaphragmatic dysfunction which we can look for uh, the question on infection control was asked by dr anirban anirban dev from kolkata and we have another question uh, which has come up uh, from dr mishra who says that what are the recommended reference equations for body plethysmograph in indian population in other words do we have standardized it for uh, 
our own population with their height and weight and age yeah so we do have them we do have them we have uh, we have the north indian population we have a uh, uh, patel chest standards we have pgi chandigarh standards we have south india chest standards so we have indian standards available which can be fed into the machine but i think it entirely depends upon you know the kind of population of patients you are facing so we had this problem you know the lower limit of normal as well as the the standards which have been used as the indian standards what happens is everything comes super normal in them because the kind of patients which we are looking at in a different setup will be totally different from what you see in a different setup so i think you need to uh, decide upon your own type of population whether your values are fitting which will be very evident over a couple of days you will see that fpc every time it is coming 120% so that means that whatever predicted normal we are using is actually the low one for that patient so then this is how we choose but we have indian standards available Uh-huh. and they have in the machines also incorporated so you can choose it in fact they have all standards in fed into the machine you just need to go and tick mark that this is the standard which i want to use in my lab and that will be compared and the reports would be generated it will be according compare uh, i have two important questions they are my own query one is is body plethysmograph being used before a transplant surgery is it indicated to calculate the lung volume is it must because now we are also in the era of lung transplant and how does it help how does it help i think you are very very correct because uh, lung volume measurements is suppose is, is a very important aspect of uh, you know the lung transplant because if the if the size of the lung which has come does won't fit into the patient because if the patient is very small in the chest it doesn't happen uh, most of the time ct estimations are done for that most of the time ct estimations but uh, since i am not working with a transplant so i do not have exact answer but this is a very good question so perhaps in my next seminar i will definitely give the answer to this okay. ask from my transplant okay. surgeons that what are they doing about it but no, ct estimations are done yes And everybody ct uh, estimations are as good as body plethysmograph yes uh see uh, dr talwar ild is uh, something which everybody is interested in you would be surprised if i tell you i was an examiner in one of the exam and there was a question on ild and none of the students attempted ild oh my god <laughs> yes so people love to talk about it but they don't want to write about it that is right but i would like to ask in reference to the body plethysmograph usually whenever patients of ild are treated they are uh, whenever you do a follow up of these cases you look at the symptoms you look at the exacerbation and many times earlier earlier when ct was not so prevalent people used to do bolo bronchoscopy and do the lavage and look at the cell counts and so on and so forth e4 e8 and all that the times of ct have come and now after 6 months if you want to see a response to treatment or even after an year and if patient is even if stable and you want to look whether how in which way the disease is progressing a ct is advised now when we look at a body plethysmograph which can surely tell you about the interstitial lung disease and once it is diagnosed on ct do you think body plethysmograph would be much better in a follow up to look at the response to treatment so i think i'm asking okay i'm asking this from two point of view one is whether it is a good test second is would it not avoid radiation and third is would it be cost effective because what is the comparable cost in the metros so i think um, your question is very pertinent and correct rather that uh, one reason is that ct is easy to perform easy to get it done patients are too sick to undergo lung function tests they can easily undergo the ct scan that's the invariable excuse but if you look at the data the response of the therapy is entirely dependent upon lung functions whether they are improving or not ct scan is one aspect of it but it is not the complete forum of it so you have a battery of tests which are basically towards to looking at monitoring the patients of interstitial lung disease that includes the forced vital capacity that includes the diffusion capacity that includes the total lung capacity and that depends upon the 6 minute walk test distance so all these four parameters are there however since most of the clinical trials when they are done on any pharmacotherapy or something like that they want to keep it simple so fvc 
six minute walk test distance are the most commonly used monitoring parameters to demonstrate that the patient is improving or stable or the decline is not as fast as it would have happened if we wouldn't have given the drug to the patient so that's precisely what is going on so if you ask us in clinical practice what do you do so in clinical practice we do many more lung functions rather than the ct scans we we'll, i i fail to understand why so many ct scans are being done every like six weeks so you don't expect in six weeks the ct scans to be like changing so much on the other hand your lung functions will change much faster so i think we need to do that but because of the covid times now we are going to be very restricted and looking at stable versus unstable patient improving versus pro, pro, deteriorating patients and choosing our patients accurately for not only the lung functions but also for the ct scan but i think very right I, accurately you have asked about body box so the how the body box will play a role so body box you know the we know that the total lung capacity is the only thing which will be very important to patients with interstitial lung disease but as i told you that the tlc can be affected by other things like neuromuscular diseases causing restriction rather than pulmonary fibrosis so it can be that because of the steroids patients are developed myopathy and the tlc is still low while the patient is improved so i think that is the reason why we are still going by fpc as the standard uh, monitoring parameter in patients with interstitial lung diseases with 6 minute walk test distance and with this uh, we we do not have much questions now from the audience i have another question which has been in my mind when i started going to the uh, body plethysmography uh, we all are aware and we come across many of the ilds that we see are usually related even with the occupational lung disease that's one and there may be people who may not manifest as interstitial lung disease but they have lot of disability related with occupational lung disease as pulmonologists many patients are being referred to us to comment upon their x rays as well as ct but i personally feel that even if there is a, that uh, ilo marking and uh, pmq opacities and so on and so forth i always feel that all these things are very subjective to comment upon the disability do you feel that body box would be a good method to evaluate the disability in a patient of uh, who has occupational lung disease and uh, it should also be telling us about the level of disability and to determine whether he should be continuing with or not these are two questions and the third one is can body box as we have seen or rather i would ask my question later on you answer these two parts yeah your questions are very difficult dr radha because uh, i know you are working with occupational lung diseases and uh, disability is primarily not looking at the chest x ray it is looking at physical disability of the patient if he is That's not able to perform the activity then that is what is called physical disability but most of the times you are correct that you look at the chest x ray and you say already the silica changes are coming or nodules have started appearing in so there are changes but actual physical uh, physical disability is related to the basically what we are looking at is primarily the lung functions and it may not be only fvc total lung capacity is equally important diffusion capacity is equally important there and their severities amounts to the amount of disability to be given to the patient actually so in the western uh, literature where you know this this is much more rigorous process of disability evaluation and giving the certificates and then compensations have to be paid so there are much more rigid guidelines for uh, doing this test and there the body box is a standard procedure to be done in all patients who are undergoing evaluation for physical disability in occupational lung diseases where there is a potential of reasonable amount of compensation being offered to these people so in a year or two perhaps we may have our own uh, guidelines for uh, evaluating disability yeah, and asking for compensation yeah because we are getting now more and more queries about occupational lung diseases and uh, the and 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 all, all industry is very uh, concerned about the occupational lung diseases now uh, and do you think body plethysmographic values would be able to give us a cut off value where we can say that this person is uh, like uh, Uh, not about the symptoms that are unable to perform his activities but can we give a cut off value where we say that he should be retiring or not going to the 
so yeah. i think we, we we have these values for the western standards we do not have indian standards for it but in in particular if you ask me how your body box is because there are two things body box is uh, like more accurate that's one thing it is definitely more accurate and two it is repetitively you can do it so if you do it two times body box the deterioration is real so the amount of variability between the tests as well as the accuracy of the test is much more by body box so in fact if we use any functional parameter for giving the disability certification it would be much better to use a body box to get an accurate values rather than use any other method of determination like other methods to do other tests in fact when i was looking at all these uh, the what you have presented uh, and in our part of the country like in central india uh, we commonly see more and more cases of sickle cell disease yes. we have evaluated these cases by doing spirometry and we have even done dlc uh, uh, ncu of the cases but i think going ahead with body box do you think body box would be better at looking at their lung function because they are known to have vaso occlusive crisis repeated chest infection very frankly rather i have no uh, experience of working with sickle cell diseases as far as the lung functions are concerned so i don't have i know the diffusion capacity is perhaps the most important thing because sickling is happening there so that is one of the most important parameter but what happens to the lung volumes uh, or airway resistance i have no idea i have not worked on that so that remains to be explored uh, for uh, many It's of for us. you to take care because you have plenty of patients coming for the sickle uh, yes. cell disease yes we have lot many patients coming up. so with that we have uh, uh, i have exhausted my quota of question uh, dr talwar do you think uh, something uh, remains to be covered or do you want to add some uh, take home message for the audience they have waited for a long time but yeah. still they can take whatever is needed in two lines two three quick lines so i think the idea of uh, today's uh, series was to make you acquaint with the body box not to get scared of and how to interpret it and some of the things which are how simple so although it is called an advanced lung function test now body box but it is no it's more and more in the west actually it is the only way the the things are done so i don't think so in 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 uh, if you see in any big institute uh, any country abroad there they don't have a body box and they use it routinely for every patient so they will not do it that i will do spirometry today and lung volumes after one week or if required or not no and first go everything is done because that gives you a comprehensive evaluation of the patient doing test bits by bits is something not not going to be useful for that so that's how the body box can be incorporated into your daily practice and help you a lot actually and overall maintenance cost is so low that the money will be recovered very soon i suppose so that that should not be an issue and understanding the body box uh, the physiology may be a little difficult initially but once you see that almost everything is automatic you attach the patient it starts the procedure and goes on okay uh, so with that we have come to a wonderful webinar and uh, dr talwar hats off to you for carrying on for more than 2 hours and still the audience is uh, waiting for us and not only today but i have seen you just a day back in another webinar and uh, just i i can't stop appreciating your enthusiasm as well as commitment no topic is left incomplete and you have not left any effort behind even to assess the audience and uh, their attention was to your presentation uh, there have been comments which have come in place of questions they have fully appreciated your presentation they have said that they have understood it in a better way and their fear have decreased and uh, i am really speechless there is so much of learning to do on body box and still you have made it so simple a big thank you to your pack as well as the indian chess society and shiller india which has supported this program and of course the it team which has been working with us uh, uh, yesterday as well as today and audience a big thank you to all you all of you not only for joining but actively participating interacting and they have given an honest feedback whenever there was loss of volume or they could not see questions and i'm sure our it team would look into it because dr talwar is going to come up with another webinar in a short duration 
we'll see you again in the second episode of advanced lung function test the date and time will be shared by the organizers in due course a wonderful evening we have had and a wonderful time ahead for all of you thank you thank you so much for letting me to be a part thank of thank you dr rana for such a wonderful moderator and uh, you know how the time passed i just didn't realize it actually you have been a wonderful moderator and uh, i really i i really wish to work with you more on this kind of uh, activities which are for purely our idea is that we should be able to drive what we want to drive to the people who are attending this and if that is achieved then at the end of the day everybody is happy about it thank you very much dr radha thank you shiller india for uh, giving us an opportunity and uh, thank you ics for doing it under ics platform and i thank from my side also to every delegate every participant who has been through us for this two more than two hours of sessions in fact two and a half hours thank you very much Every, everybody including nandita mohua anu and so many of them working behind the scene a big thank you to all of you shall we sign off dr talwar yes. yes thank you doctor